Okay, welcome everyone to a new episode of the Science Applied series. In this video, we're hitting a more posterior chain-focused leg day, meaning we're gonna be targeting the glutes and hamstrings more than the quads. And this is gonna be the second lower body workout for the week, so day three of our new upper-lower split, which is based on my new upper-lower size and strength training program. Now, for the record, the workouts that I'm doing in these videos are not exactly the same as those in the training program, but they're based on many of the same training principles and follow very similar volumes. So you guys can have an idea of what to expect if you do decide to pick up the program. And as we'll see at the end of the video, when we tally up the total training volume for both sessions, now you can certainly run these workouts as a four day upper lower split and still have enough weekly volume to make solid progress, especially if you're further from that more advanced end of the training experience spectrum. Okay, so after completing the full warm up routine, which I'll be covering in a future video, we're gonna jump into our first exercise for the day which is the deadlift, where we're doing two sets of five reps in week one, and then adding one set every week until we reach a total of four sets in week three, before again returning to two sets of five in week four, but with more weight. And I like this volume-focused double progression for very technical lifts like the deadlift, overhead press, and even the pull-up, because it allows you to accumulate more practice with the lift, which will improve strength rapidly as you get more proficient with the movement, and you'll also reap more size gains from that progressive volume accumulation. Now you can pull either sumo or conventional. However, if you're accustomed to always pulling with one variation, it may not be a bad idea to switch to the other for the next month or two just to experiment and potentially improve any weak points in the lift. And especially since the sumo deadlift is a very nice accessory movement for developing conventional deadlift strength, and vice versa. Now the main differences in terms of muscle activation patterns are that sumo deadlifts hit the quads a bit more and conventional deadlifts hit the spinal erectors of the lower back a bit more, but glute and hamstring activation is actually very similar between the two. So periodically varying these movements makes sense. Also, I think it makes much more sense to put the deadlift on a lower body day rather than an upper body day or back day since so much more of the lower body is targeted than the upper body. Granted an activation study from knowing colleagues found that the lats are actually highly active in the deadlift, but only near the beginning of the lift, we're at about 70% of the way up, there's a massive drop off in activation. So no doubt the lats do play a very important stabilizing role in keeping the spine extended, and preventing the bar from drifting out in front of you. Also, this 2002 paper found that the upper traps are most active at the point where the bar is passing the knee, while the mid traps are most active at the beginning of the lift. However, these muscles of the back are still only playing a stabilizing role, contracting isometrically without a concentric and eccentric contraction, whereas the quads, glutes, and hamstrings are all lengthening and shortening under load, placing much higher work demands on these muscles than any of the muscles of the upper body. Okay, after that, we're doing three sets of eight on a wide stance box squat, where we're gonna add one rep each week until we reach 10 reps in week three, and then go back to eight reps in week four with more weight. And because this is a posterior chain-focused leg day, here we're making four modifications to the squat that are all gonna help transform the lift into a more glute and hamstring dominant movement. First, we're using a low bar position where the bar sits down on the rear delts instead of up on the upper traps. And according to this 2017 study from Glassbrook et al., if you're seeking to develop the posterior chain hip musculature, so the glutes, hamstrings, and erectors, you may want to use the low bar back squat. Now, when using the low bar position, you wanna make sure that you're still keeping the bar perfectly centered over the middle of the foot on the way down and on the way up. So to make this possible, you want to initiate the descent by really sitting your hips back without causing your chest to collapse forward. And you don't need to worry about losing your balance and falling back since the box is there for you to sit on anyway, which is the second modification. And using the box is really gonna allow you to sit your hips back which is another cue that's gonna emphasize the hip musculature over the knee musculature. And you wanna set the box to around the height of your kneecap or to the point where you reach parallel once you're sat on the box. And the third modification is to use a wider stance up to two times shoulder width, if that's comfortable for you, since according to research from Paoli and colleagues, a large stance width is necessary for greater activation of the gluteus maximus during back squats. And finally, we're gonna be using more foot flare than usual, rotating the feet out by as much as 45 degrees, since one of the primary functions of the glutes is hip external rotation. So the combination of the low bar placement, the cue to really sit back onto the box, the wider stance, and the increased foot flare, we can transform the more quad dominant standard back squat into a very glute and hamstring dominant box squat. Also, even though I think specificity is crucial for developing squat strength, 
meaning if you want a big squat, you need to squat often. Variations on the squat like box squats, front squats, and paused squats are still highly specific while training potential weak points in the standard squat. So including variety like this not only makes sense for hypertrophy, but also for maximizing strength over the long term. And this exercise may feel a bit awkward at first, but just be patient with it and start by loading lighter than you normally would on the normal back squat in this rep range. Okay, up next we're doing three sets of 12 reps on the constant tension barbell hip thrust. Now this is an exercise that's been discussed a lot, but one thing I don't see many people doing is using a constant tension approach where you focus on the top half of the range of motion. And while there isn't anything necessarily wrong with allowing the hips to flex all the way down to allow for a greater range of motion, research from Warrell et al. found that the glutes fire the hardest when they're in or near full hip extension, meaning you'll get the greatest glute bang for your buck by focusing on that top aspect of the thrust. Also, I find that many people use the very bottom aspect of the range to just let the bar passively rest, which again, isn't necessarily problematic, especially if it allows you to load more heavily, but it may not have the glutes firing to their maximum potential throughout the set. Also, even though it hasn't been focused on the glutes per se, more and more research has been hinting toward a potential benefit a more constant tension approach where you don't allow the muscle to rest in between reps. So I think that on an exercise like the hip thrust, which can benefit from more of an intentional internal focus, performing reps without that little break at the bottom in between reps makes sense. Also, even though we're focusing on the walkout aspect of the lift, you still wanna be careful to avoid hyperextending your lower back at the top. So be sure to end the range once your hips get to that neutral position and then reverse the motion under control. And here, because we're trying to isolate the glutes, I'd recommend going lighter and really focusing on nailing down the mind-muscle connection as much as possible. And we're gonna pretty much finish off this workout with a quad and hamstring superset. So three sets of 20 reps on the leg extension, supersetted with three sets of 20 reps on the seated leg curl. However, what we're gonna be doing differently here is rather than finishing the 20 reps on the leg extension and then immediately jumping right into 20 reps of leg curls, we're actually gonna rest for 30 seconds between each and every set. So we'll do 20 reps on the extensions, rest 30 seconds, do 20 reps of curls, rest another 30 seconds, do another 20 reps of extension, and so on until you complete three sets of each. And I like this approach, especially if you're doing higher rep supersets, because there's no rule that says you need to rest zero seconds or as little as possible between supersets. It's mostly just a tool to help you keep the pace up. And having that 30 seconds rest between supersets will help you catch your breath and allow you to push yourself harder on every set without feeling winded for no real benefit. So rather than resting, say, one minute between each round, just split the time up and rest 30 seconds between each superset and see if you can notice how much even that little bit of rest time allows you to recover in between those exercises. And of course, we're at the end of the workout here. We've got the heavy deadlifting and squatting done. So the main purpose here is to just squeeze in a bit more volume and a bit more of that metabolic stress oriented rep zone to really finish things off. And finally, we're doing seated calf raises and ab wheel rollouts to finish out the workout. With the seated calf raise, we're doing eight reps with a full pause at the bottom and a squeeze at the top with a nice and slow negative. And then on the final eight reps, we're gonna kind of just pulse out the reps in the middle of the range. So I'm not bouncing out of the bottom, but not pausing or squeezing either. And for the ab wheel rollouts, we're doing three sets of eight reps. And the main thing to focus on here is thinking about the movement as a sort of dynamic plank, where you're making the plank progressively more difficult as your arms move out in front of you and the lever lengthens. Also this 2008 study from Yudis et al. showed the ab wheel exercise to have the highest EMG activation of out of the four exercises tested, including the crunch. So it's a solid movement to include. You just wanna make sure that you're squeezing your glutes throughout the entire range of motion, and you wanna prevent your spine from extending on every rep by actively engaging your abs. And if you find your lower back dipping down too much, you may need to cut the range of motion a bit shorter until you master the technique. Okay, so guys, I'm gonna tally up the volume here for each body part for both leg workouts and put it up here on the screen if you'd like to pause and read for more on volume. And I think this is plenty of volume for beginners and probably enough for most intermediate trainees to make progress just simply running these workouts as a four day per week split. However, if you are more advanced, you may want to add in a third leg day each week, uh, perhaps adding in a little more volume for what your specific weak area is, whether that be hamstrings, glutes, quads, calves, or abs. And since my upper lower size and strength program is geared more toward intermediate to advanced level lifters, it uses the six day per week split 
hitting every body part three times per week. And if you guys would like to jump in with that training program, you can pick it up at jeffnipper.com. I actually just finished up week three myself and I'm loving it so far. So I'll put a button to that program over here if you'd like to check it out. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next video.